All right, Mr. Cody Wilson, welcome to our therapy session. It is my pleasure to be here, Garrett. I think all those all those victims, the aggrieved, those suffering trauma, they deserve answers. They deserve warm counsel and comfort. Um, I'm happy that we could do this. It took some convincing. You had to convince me, didn't you? Well, you know, I I, I knew that it was the right thing to do. You know, um, trauma is a cycle, um, and I think we can we can stop the cycle here. <laughs> so. I hurt people hurt people, man. You know, I, I know people want answers. The the people demand it. And, you know, we're nothing if not admirers of folk theories of democracy around these parts. So no, of course. Of course. People and have what they want. We're we're nothing but communicative, right? That's what people think when they think of defense distributed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ac access, communication, yeah. Clarity. You know, I I guess you want to model this like how when we're we have conversations on the phone. And in those conversations, I feel like you're often a really good advocate for the community, right? And it's almost like, uh, it's almost like what they say, like, you know, the right thing, Garrett, help, help him do the right thing. Uh, but I just, there's so much history, there's so much context, so much to say. It's, it's boring and exhausting for me to even contemplate it. How could I ever say it all? Who would ever, ever sit around to listen to it? I'm almost like, you know, my own theory of history is like, well, the point of it is to make things harder to understand, not easier. So I almost feel like being an antagonist with you tonight, but tell me, tell me what we're going to do. Tell me what the good people have, have tuned in for. I, I appreciate you fluffing me up, and uh, I'm sure that that's going to be taken as, as truth by those who are hearing this, but this is you my walked, role. <laughs> you walked right into that one, man. I don't tell you. <laughs> but yeah, what are we doing tonight? So, okay, you know, I, I looked up some, uh, some information about how therapy is conducted, um, and it looks like uh, when a trauma has happened, uh, there are three steps to to healing from that trauma. The first is finding safety and stabilization. So that is to say, you know, what is the actual truth? You know, your, your mind might be telling you one thing, but what is the actual truth of the matter? What is the frame in which you are actually operating? Uh, the second step of healing from trauma is remembrance and mourning. So looking back onto, um, you know, your own history, perhaps with the, the person who or the, or the group who traumatized you and uh, what actually happened there. And step three is reconnection and integration. How do we proceed from the trauma? How do we learn to live with the trauma? Maybe how can we even grow from the trauma? Um, and I don't know if we'll be able to stick to this this basic frame, but that's that's the rough order that I'd, I'd like to proceed in, if you're okay with that. Yeah, that feels warm and empowering. It feels like you're lifting up silenced voices, Garrett, and giving hope. You yeah. know, that, that really is our, um, our interlocutors here, our, our silenced voices. Yeah, I feel that. Um, you know, a lot of people woke up uh, last week and the week before and realized they were working in a free software culture. Oops. <laughs> that that had to hurt. That had to hurt. Um, so, you know, what? we're here. I'm here. You know, don't let it be said that I wasn't responsive. I don't think that will ever be said about you. So, OK, you, you give me a good segue into into step one safety and stabilization um let, let's figure out you know what is the actual reality in which we're operating what is the actual history of defcad what is the actual history of foss um and i i don't intend that we go too deep into this because number one it, it's too easy to get it bogged down into this it's a long history that we have both both foss and defense distributed much longer than than most of the people in this community have been around for um there's just too much there to really go into in detail so let's hit some of the major highlights, starting with the fact that DEFCAD is founded in 2012 so that we can host uh, the files that we're creating, the AR-15 lower, the magazine, eventually the Liberator, right? And you make the intentional decision when setting up DEFCAD to found it uh, as a FOSS website and to put the files you're releasing uh, on DEFCAD out under FOSS licenses. Uh, is that correct? And can you tell us about that? That's right. We thought at the time, this is August 2012. We don't even have anything necessarily to publish yet. We're just just getting after it. We think we're going to publish on Thingiverse. And after our first successful test in 2012, the Sandy Hook shooting happens in December 2012. And Thingiverse gets basically the, the first casualty was, okay, no more gun files on Thingiverse. So we were like, well, what's our theory then of a platform and can we build one? And we called back to the original meeting that we had had with the Institute for Justice and some other attorneys when we formed Defense Distributed. We, we formed that meeting in July of 2012. We said, hey, you know, what's going to happen here? We're going to make a gun or some gun parts, put it online. What's the most likely way that the feds are going to try to stop us? Remember, Obama's president. And so Clark Neely, I remember, was in that call, and, and he highlighted the ITAR. And 
as we would end up learning, you know, not a year later, it was the ITAR that we had to fight. So we had to settle a way to publish files, both to signal like we wanted to people who were, you know, advocates of WikiLeaks and advocates of free software to signal that what we were doing was open source and, and free, and also publish in a way that the ITAR would deem as published, where we could at least have an argument when we got in trouble and went to court. Well, that, well, we thought we were complying with the ITAR because we thought that was the most likely thing they'd, they'd come after us for. So we knew we'd need to settle on some kind of open source license. We deferred what license that would be, but we did decide it wouldn't be Creative Commons. We knew we were going to pick some type of OSI or free software license. Sure, sure. I mean, there are certainly varying degrees of of FOSS, of open source, right? Some licenses are are more and some are less. Uh, but our intent was definitely to pick the uh, the most open one that we could find. Uh, look, Liberator ended up being, when we did Liberator, and we had different licenses for the for the stuff before that, like you mentioned, the AR-15 uh, receiver. When we did Liberator, it was a modified BSD three clause, I think. We had Tor Ackland look at that. You know, we had Michael Weinberg of Public Knowledge. We, we notified EFF of what we were doing beforehand because we knew something was going to happen. We were going to get sued. There, there was just too much attention on what we were doing. So it both needed to signal the praxis of like, well, you release your stuff and you let people do whatever they want with it. But it also had to still meet the Fed's kind of cynical media theory that, well, there needs to be an argument that this is published. And, you know, we learned later, we had inklings of it then from like R Street Institute and other people that they may use like the eminent domain power and just on the theory of copyright, just take the file and say, well, you know, we, we have this now. So even in the publication, we wanted to say, well, a lot of the rights are disclaimed here. This is an open source activity, regardless of what happens to the immediate file. Right, right. So th there's almost sort of three major senses that we're, we're pursuing when we're, we're publishing under FOSS, one of which is, as you mentioned, there's simply an instrumental case for doing this, right? We, we argue that these files are, they're FOSS, they're in the public domain, meaning that ITAR does not apply. Second is, as you mentioned, that if these are published uh, open source, that takes away certain other weapons uh, that the feds are able to, to utilize to try to censor these files. And th there is a third sense of, of which um, ESR goes into deeply in his work, right? Which is that FOSS is simply the best way to organize a community of, uh, of developers who are, are collaboratively working on on software, or you know, in this case, on on gun files, and this is the uh, theoretical way that produces the most innovation. And you know, I don't think we were thinking about that one quite as much when we set up DefCAD because there there really was no community at the time. Uh, it was more the first two, uh, but it's that it's that third item that we have uh, since actually seen bear the most fruit. You know, I mean, there were people were using GPL licenses on Thingiverse at the time. I mean, it it was known even when this was a small group of people, maybe even less than like twelve people doing this online you would call it a free software activity. Like we, we were saying that, okay? It was intentional that way. And I took, you know, the WikiLeaks approach. We became friends with the Swedish pirate party. You know, we used the copy me logo on one of the old DevCads. I mean, we were, you know, we were friends with the Pirate Bay guys, right? We were doing everything we could to say, hey, everybody copy this. You know, this is one way of getting outside of any, any strictures or bad faith attempts to say, well, actually this is property and we're doing it for safety. And, you know, and there was also a knowledge that like it was, it might be dangerous to do it commercially. Right. So we wanted to do it free for that reason, too. We didn't want there to be some argument that we were selling the files. And I'm sure you want to get into that in this talk as well. So, you know, there's just a, a ton of that stuff was being talked about then. It's just even even like now, there wasn't a settled license standard. And we wanted to be sure that we were signaling to, to all sides of the community that we could that this was for them, too. So like you make a very good point, right, that it's not like we were literally the only people doing this at the time but you know in that that earliest of communities containing people like like have blue and and possibly do so i'm not sure if he was prior or, or after dd but in any case some of these guys were sharing their stuff others were just sort of posting pictures of it and there, there wasn't really this sense uh universal sense that you know you make a gun file you should share it um and if you do share it you know you should you should make sure that other people can can modify it can remix it like that that sense just didn't i think exist in the way that it does now um, and I think that we must credit our introduction of, of FOSS norms into this community that built that sense. That's true, but it may be overstating it. Like, you know, have, have Blue put his stuff up on Thingiverse. And there was an early testing culture, too, because have Blue he showed the finite element analysis he did on his 22 receiver. And we tried to do the same thing, right? When we, when we actually released the, the AR-15 receiver, we called that our version 5, right? And we... We had a blog at the time and we showed like, well, these are the steps we make. This is how things broke. You know, we think, you know, before we release it, uh, you know, we should, it should go through another round of testing. Maybe you should do a hundred rounds before we release it. Even, even that is not necessarily open source. And we weren't thinking open source as 
the ultimate value to control all other values. But you could see there was early testing culture, there was early publication and discussion. And then actually the Thingiverse ban helped because everyone just like met up at DefCAD uh, on the IRC or in the forums and then kind of shared what they were doing. And, and this is one of the first times, it probably is the first time that the community quote unquote gets together and starts talking about, well, this is how I'm doing it and sharing notes. Right, right, right. Okay, so this is like 2012. Liberator comes in 2013. And I'll, I'll detour into sort of a brief trot through our legal history in a, in a second. But maybe it's more interesting to me to note that, of course, um, after we have to take them to Liberator due to threats from the government, the community sort of splits off from us at that point and, and becomes FOSCAD in a sense. And perhaps you can talk more about that. I like the way you set that up. Because, you know, it contains an assumption like, well, we have to stop and we have to sue the government. That was not obvious at the time. And that actually, I think, is one of the bigger reasons that FOSCAD emerges and splits off from DEFCAD. Everybody called themselves DEFCAD back then, even though I would say and said then DEFCAD was DD. DEFCAD was Defense Distributed you know, Operation. So what was the accusation and the attack from that time? The accusation was, hey, you guys shouldn't stop. You guys are abandoning your open source ethos by taking an operational pause and thinking about how to fight the feds. You should ignore them. If you were real heroes, you'd just keep on going and we'd force this constitutional crisis right here, right now. And people in the US were saying that, people worldwide were saying that. And I wasn't saying, hey, you can't keep doing this work at DEFCAD, but that was the big conflict. And there were other conflicts about like, you know, commercialization and stuff, but FOSCAD takes its name as a kind of attack on the values of DEFCAD from the open source direction saying that DEFCAD is not open source enough and DEFCAD is not actually devoted to free software. They want to play politics and, and fight big government. So we are FOSCAT and we are going to carry the torch and communicate the actual values of free open source. Like that is the origin of that community, not just a bunch of you know shitheads on Reddit. <laughs> a rather strange state of affairs. Well, I'm going to ask you to justify later on, like why why it is necessary to uh, to fight the government. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Foscad was right, but let's let's take that short tour now, just through the legal history, um, because of course we do get is threatened the right word uh, by State Department over publishing the the Liberator um, under ITAR. Uh, give us a brief overview of that. Man, I'll try to list. You know, and I know people didn't tune in here to listen to ancient history. But like when I see that transcript of like that Froge cast with PLA boy, and we, we got to hit on that as much as we can, because it's like the most innocent, pure distillation of like current community thinking. It's just so ripe for analysis. But he says, oh, with these other dudes in this cast, well, that ITAR stuff, I mean, that that's like for new codes and like that's for like heavy weapons and stuff like that could have never actually been something that anyone ever had to deal with. You know, why is Odyssey up? <laughs> and, you know, versions of that conversation were happening. Then, because GrabCAD stayed up in 2012 and 2013, nobody fucked with GrabCAD. And so it was a constant accusation of like, hey, you don't have to do this. You don't have to fight the State Department. And it was misunderstood at the time. Okay, what? You had a letter? So what? It wasn't just a letter, dude. They said we violated the ITAR and they were proceeding with enforcement actions. And then we had to do commodity, what's called like a commodity disclosure or whatever, the disclosure process. So we got forced into this thing. And as soon as we, you get forced into this thing, the outcome of that thing is always some type of civil or criminal penalty. You say, why do we have to do this? It's not obvious that we had to do it, but the hope was that if we took this moment uh, and didn't just rely on the mercy of the State Department to, to somehow just kind of let us go, uh, that we could, like our heroes in the crypto anarchy and cypherpunk movement, those hackers of the 1990s who liberated PGP as like a public technology, we hope we could bring that old band of libertarians back together, like literally some of the same people like Cindy Cohn and EFF. We hope that we could fight again, like our own version of the crypto wars, this time for guns, this time with the same arguments, code is free speech, all that stuff, even if that's not exactly what was going on. But we were able to shape it that way. We took the time, we recruited Alan Gura and all these dudes, these specialists in ITAR, and we actually crafted a First Amendment attack, which you know made the government look pretty bad. And it seemed like a legitimate play. And I was excited to make it because getting the standing to do something like that is very rare and almost a responsibility. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we start the fight against the State Bar uh, Department in 2013. Fast forward up to 2018, which is when really that, that essentially resolves itself. This whole time, the question is, can we put these files up and can we put them up for free? Just to make this clear, DEFCAD did not work the way it does back then. We're, we're putting these files up as a direct download thing, essentially, you know, Odyssey before Odyssey. And this is the question, are we are we allowed 
to do so. Is code actually free speech? So we reach 2018 and we, we reach essentially a settlement with the State Department. And give us a brief overview of that. Sure. OK, we take we take five years. Now, that's not just five years of hoping things work out. Let's just work on Ghost Gunner and forget about files. That's five years of saying, all right, how can we run DefCAD when we win, when we get this weird you know, outcome? Like something's going to happen where the government doesn't entirely win. How can we run DefCAD? So we ran all these different simulations and ways of doing it infrastructurally, ways that conform with you know, the ER and other things that we thought we'd be vulnerable to. OK, so while that's all happening, we finally get to this place where even we didn't expect it, a kind of rapid settlement. And then we begin behind the scenes negotiations with the Department of Justice and we say, OK, this thing's coming back up. Now, it's not going to be like it was. Probably it, it can't be commercial. You know, we're not going to run Google ads on it or something. It's going to be a highly contested site. But we still thought the files could all be direct download, free, anywhere in the world. And if not anywhere in the world, whatever license we would get would allow us, you know, very limited restrictions. So we, we were preparing to build a site while we're doing these negotiations with Department of Justice in early 2018. And you want me to say... Then what? Is that, is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Then what? We do build such a site, though. And this is around the time that I, I joined the company, right? So I'm, I'm part of building that first, or I guess, second iteration of DefCAD. Um, I have very fond memories of that. And so we put it up. Um, and of course, then the other shoe drops. Um, and uh, 26, I think, uh, attorneys general, like every right. blue attorney general in the nation all band together. And, and this was not, you know, the there were whistleblowers within the bureaucracy and without, and we did a big thing with Wired and all these state governments said, this settlement is, is scheduled to go into effect. We're going to run to court and we're going to stop this before it even happens, right? And we played this game where we were telling people August 1st, August 1st or what, you know, and we got the files up earlier. It didn't matter. There was one day we had to do like three or four injunction hearings in a row in different federal courts across the country. Finally, we got tagged. It was in Washington. And okay, the next five years is us doing the same thing again. This time, not just fighting the feds, but now fighting, like you said, 20-something states in a federal court. And it's hopelessly muddled, right? The question is not clean. The question is, do the states even have the right to be here? Are we even a necessary party? You know, why do we have to get rope doped into this thing? This is kind of like between them and the feds. It was a mess, dude. And of course, I made it even messier with my hijinks, like Assange style running all over the world. So this was a crazy time. And yet the conflict is still over whether we can put those files up for free, which we did every time we got an opening in court. We did it like three or four times. Right, right. I think 2018 is is attempt number two. And we'll come back to this story because it's it's important for uh, the community's history as well um, as the place where Deterrence Dispensed is founded. But we'll get back to that. 2018 is attempt number two to put the files up. I think they're up for five days. And then, yeah, the, the states come in and we take them back down. Fast forward again to 2020 and we get yet another opportunity, right? That's right. Now, like you said, the community begins to be our partner in how we are building and promoting DefCAD from 2018 to 2020, because largely the new groups of the community get formed in 2018 because of how big and high profile that fight is. And I guess I'd say, you know, for sociological reasons or something, for materials reasons, 3D printers are finally cheap enough that like lots of people can get in on, on the act at this point. You know, Chinese mass manufacturer has like enabled lots of people now to fight the State Department, not just these crazy dudes in Austin, Texas. So for lots of reasons, we're kind of in discussions now with the community, even though we're we're boxed up. They're talking to about how they're doing it. Right. Libraries involved like there, now there's different methods of, OK, there's a formal way that we're fighting power. But there's this kind of informal, positive, almost lack of knowledge, which is the positive function that not knowing of just how bad or how intricate the State Department stuff is actually becomes one of the motors of the development of GunCAD. Everyone's just developing stuff anyway, you know, uh, codeisfreespeech.com and this, you know, we have to start fighting New Jersey. And this is like the most interesting flowering time where people just put the stuff up anyway, like true hackers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Enabled perhaps in part by the fact that we're tying up the feds in court, giving them a, a shadow cone in a sense to, uh, to operate within. I, I would make that claim. There's some kind of dome, <laughs> right? like protecting... <laughs> some of his lower level activity. And, you know, dudes are getting sniped on Twitter and losing their accounts back then. Uh, you know, Elon doesn't have the platform yet. But yeah, I would argue, I've, I've described it to you this way, like the Pax Distributata. Like even when it's difficult and we're really dug in with the feds, even in that time leading up to 21, there's not a strong enough theory for how to get us and how big the activity is. And in fact, the states, especially when they're fighting us, are ignoring the fact that this is happening on Odyssey and other websites. Even when we cite it and point to it, they're like, well, you know, actually, I think we're entitled to findings of fact here. 
there's this kind of pretense, this game where before a judge, they're saying, well, it's your honor, it's really just this one company and you know, we can keep it all in the bottle. So that's the game, just making them even take judicial notice, you know, that the fact that other people are doing this. I know this is getting wildly off topic, but I just I have to comment on this, right? Like you're exactly correct, right? That that the uh, not just the the arguments in court, right? About, you know, it's DefCAD. DefCAD is where the files are. We shut down DefCAD. We shut down the files. Like this is not just the, the argument being made in court. It's the argument being made in the media, right? It's the argument being made on uh, on the, the evening news. I remember very well, right? In the lead up to the launch in 2018, right? Uh, where we are, we're, we're launching August 1st. Uh, oh my God, 3D gun files will be on the internet August 1st, 2018, right? Uh, you can go to Instagram and get an Instagun. This, this conceit, right? That um, if we just stop DefCAD, all of these problems go away. Like it's no wonder that they they want to focus on us because uh, that's a very convenient narrative. They can save the day just by taking out one website. Right. And that's what the current community works on as well as an assumption. Everything will be roses for them if they can just take down this one website. Ain't that funny how, uh, uh, <laughs> how the sides change over time. <laughs> you know, honestly, then. Uh, but look, I know you want to get to 21. Because 21 is the biggest moment. Like COVID happens, March of 20 is very interesting because we're able to sneak DefCAD back online even while we're getting beat up in court. And they didn't see that coming. And all these state governments are kind of overwhelmed by the COVID response. And so Letitia James and Ferguson, all these people, they give up on the approach they had taken against us just a couple of years ago. And they just write it off. They literally just write a letter to the State Department being like, hey, these guys are definitely breaking federal law. Do something about it. And then they go on to other things. So DefCAD sneaks its way back on, a, on the internet in, in March of 2020 with the approval of you know, Jay Stark and the, and the other leaders of the other parts of the community. And we begin to pilot quasi-commercial modes of operating DefCAD because these guys, you know, they want money. They want money for development. Sure. And I mean, I, I guess I'll go a bit into what we mean by, by quasi-commercial, right? There, there's two aspects to this. Part of the way that we sneak back onto the internet uh, in March of 2020, you know, the, the month of COVID, is by setting up these, these tests, the tests that are still on the website today, right? You're required to have a membership. You're required to uh, do some kind of personhood test, something that we've tinkered and monkeyed with uh, over the years to find the, the best way to do this. The theory being, right, that uh, by having these tests, maybe we can actually keep the fucking files up this time. Uh, so this this is option one. Yeah. The the other aspect of, of commercialization is from the beginning, we are looking for a way to get money into the hands of, of developers, because at this point, there is a, a large enough community now that is is struggling with the challenge of how do we self fund? How do we pay for filament? How do we pay for ammo? And we say, okay, well, how can we how can we help with this? Well, we're by far the largest platform out there. That is still the case to this day. Most of the eyeballs are on us. So uh, perhaps people will want to donate to these developers. Uh, and so we set up a donation tool and we get uh, most of the, the major developers uh, in the terms dispensed, uh, which was really the only group at that time. We, we get them uh, set up with this donation tool. And, you know, spoiler alert, I think we process a total of three total donations through that. This is this is the extent to which the community is willing to uh, to donate to to the, the creators of their files, uh, which was I mean, I'm, I'm laughing at that now, but it was a disappointment at the time. Right. I think it was a disappointment to all involved that realized just how um, how unwilling the community is to to pay for its own work. Right. And look, we did our best to console them. OK, but we were beggars, too. Like when we started Liberator, nobody likes to donate to this stuff. And there's there's better ways to do it now. Subscribe star and all this. Stuff. But still, it's tough being out there begging. And so our push with deterrence suspense in the beginning was that they should commercialize. OK, and I'm not saying that everybody's politics have to align with that. But, you know, a lot of the work we did beyond just setting up the, the DefCAD donation portal before we could get working with a bank and trying to process transactions, which would take us another year. A lot of the work we did with them was to try to say, hey, you know what you should do? Rails and stuff, you should commercially produce that. You should sell that. You should turn everything you're doing into some type of kit. You should sell it. And in the end, you know, we were right. That's that's the way all these things went. Of course, there's a lot of dispute and a lot of backbiting about how all that went down. But we tried to pick every single horse that came out. You know, that JG guy tried to make rails, we backed him. Parts dispense, right? We started buying from parts dispense. We asked, you know who, in the in the great creators of the day, Hey, just send us like good manufacturing drawings and we'll try to, you know, we'll try to get good quotes and help you sell this stuff. Of course, they weren't as interested in doing that, right? They were caught up in the, you know, the genius of, of making things. So we just went with those groups in the community that sprang up like Riptide Rails. We purchased that. We resold that stuff. We did everything we could to just promote commercialization because that seemed to be the only way that money was really moving uh, in the space. 
All right. Well, again, the idea being that if this space is going to survive, it must find some way to pay for itself, right? Like we, we cannot and then likely should not rely on uh, on free labor forever. This is the only way that we're actually going to grow as a space is if we find a way to, um, to self-sustain. That's my bit, right? That's what I believe. We were only ever trying to help these guys commercialize. And you could tell even from late 19 and coming into 20, there's a certain kind of distaste for it, right? In their in their perfect world, people should just donate to what they do because they're so great. And you know what? I, I almost agree with that. If you can find someone to patronize your work, that's better. And I think for a time, you know, FPC did support the early community. It wasn't great, but it kept them going. Anyway, there was just always this insecurity about commercialization. And I think this is still the root of all the problems we have now because there's just this post hoc, ex post facto justification for why you know, now actually, if you commercialize in the space, you're somehow violating the sacred values of GunCat. Sort of bleeding into my my intended step two, where we um, help talk the community through their own history. Uh, uh, well, back me up. Back me well, up. No, no, I, uh, absolutely. I mean, as you well know, right? Like at the time, we're all buddy buddy with everybody. Everyone gets along. Um, this is the key base days. They had a sort of secret high council channel in their key base. It was, it was called FMDA uh, at the time. And, you know, I'm in there, I'm seeing their discussion, and I see. I see considerable dismay as Stark, you know, releases his FGC nine and then his FGC nine part two, and I see dismay over the fact that oh my god, I'm, I'm not getting any donations over this. I'm not making any money off of this, right? And you know, I, I don't, I don't intend to, you know, cast aspersions on Stark, but he did go into this project believing that he would get the kind of attention and disungry funding that we got with Liberator, and when it did not happen, it was, um, it was a surprise to him. You know, in the end, I think he got what he wanted with the FGC, right? Like it's ultimate and iconic and it lives in the way he wanted it to live. But yeah, I mean, obviously he he somehow thought it would be commercial, but never put any of the work in to like ensure that that could happen. And other people commercialize. Uh, and, you know, a lot of negativity begins with the fact that like third parties begin to commercialize this work. I'll point out some other things. I don't often talk about the things that Jay Stark told me, but, you know, in a private conversation we had, he was bitter that the Mark II only made $25. He literally told me, he's like, you know, these this fucking people can't get, you know, I say, please, you know, donate to the cause. I get $25. And I say, dude, all you had to do was coordinate a release with us and we could have moved the needle more than that. I mean, damn, we could have put a button in an email saying, hey, donate to this guy, give him a hundred bucks, you know, he's, he's doing cool stuff. We had those conversations. Some of this was, you know, they had to learn those lessons themselves. They have to be independent. They have to realize they either are or are not businesses or business people. And a lot of that settled out. But you're right, man. Like These people just thought, well, donation will happen. And it took us a year, another year from 2020, to even build infrastructure that could handle payments. And by that time, the shines come off. Like These guys don't want to really talk about DEFCAD. They don't want to promote it in the way that they'd agreed to. They felt like, and to some degree, they were led by community understanding that like it feels invasive. It feels like DEFCAD is asking for too much money. You know, they're They're feeling compromised in their relationship and kind of unsure of it because they're not getting... They're not getting enough money anyway. How wh how does this help them in their mind? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, it, it saddens me to say, like, I, I think a lot of the, the the bitterness and negativity around the folks who are still in the community who were there at the time comes from this, you know, having to contend with the fact that it just didn't work the way that we thought it would. Right? We we thought that we'd be able to self fund. We thought that we would be able to just get money because, as you said, you know, we we deserve it. Right? We're we're putting out all this value into the world. And it turns out that's just not how it works. Commercialization is a different sort of thing that requires different approaches, uh, ones that they're apparently not willing to undergo. And so, well, I guess the grapes are sour anyways. We don't actually want commercialization. And, and, and the next thing is like, uh, we give developers money. <laughs> Everyone's like, I should be paid for my labor. And it's like, well, yes, that is what we do. It is a service to you. And I want to really get into this. This is actually the point of contention with the catalog. They became embarrassed that Black Lotus Coalition and Are We Cool Yet were making more money than they were on our platform. Right, right. The, the, we, we have this call with Pew, and his first complaint to us is, it's wrong that you're giving Gage more money than I am, given that my work is so much more valuable. Right. And notice that this is in moral terms. Well, it's not fair. It's wrong. And what do we say to Pew? We say, okay, dude. Well, name us a different method. And, you know, how is it ever going to be any other way than this? The remix culture starts to take on at, the, at this point. What was this, 22 when we're, when we're talking to, to Pew? Yes. So Pew has not figured out by 2022 that it's wrong 
to take money for files. And he comes to us and says, not, hey, it's wrong that you take money for files. Hey, it's wrong that I don't get more money for my files. Right. Okay. Uh, well, what do you want? You know, do you want to be a special editor of DefCAD where we like employ you or something? We, we gave him the analogy of like an editor at the All Music Guide or something. Mm -hmm. And he says, hmm, I don't know, I'll get back to you. You know, still waiting, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, I guess the idea there, of course, is that um, it's that it is wrong for them to ask. They just want to be given things unprompted. If, if they have to ask for it, that's almost an insult, right? This is true. Somewhere around 2021, let's say April, I definitely begin to understand the catalog is an intellectual property organization. And I would love to talk with you about that. This didn't just start this year. This started many years ago. Well, that's correct. I somewhat observe, again, going back to Barrams of Bitcoin 2021, before that event, we have deterrence dispense. Like the name Gatalog is not used in public to my knowledge. We have deterrence dispensed. We have several different developers. Uh, it's kind of the main space in the community. I think Are We Cool Yet does exist at this time, but I think they're they're quite small. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this. After Barrams of Bitcoin, like a few months afterwards, suddenly it's the catalog. Suddenly several developers depart or get banned from the terms dispensed. Suddenly the, uh, the, the chat that I think I mentioned somewhere else in this recording, their special like high council chat, FMDA goes dark. Um, and I think shortly thereafter they adopt uh, rocket chat, right? And so there's a lot of things going on here. I think the right way to read this is they had a couple things all happen at once that necessitate some kind of split or purge. And the catalog is the purge result of this, where everybody who didn't like IP, who didn't like this kind of ugly attitude, this this kind of bullying behavior, I think they all depart for Are We Cool Yet or get thrown out. Uh, and what is left over becomes the catalog. That's That's a good history. My personal take on it, and this is because I was on the phone with everyone involved, my personal take on it is the catalog is formed as a directly commercial organization. It is formed because people signing up for Legio and like Defense Distributed's access to DefCAD confuse that membership with membership and deterrence dispense. And everyone that becomes the leadership of the catalog realizes there's a lot of economic value to be captured in creating a new name. So they create a foundation in Florida and the tension doesn't really stop between our organizations at that point. By, I want to say late April, of 21, I'm in a TRO hearing. This might be like the final day of April in 2021. I'm in a TRO hearing in the Western District of Texas because export control reform finishes and we begin publishing, it's something like 16,000 files on the internet for free. So this is the, one of the next times that DefCAD publishes all of the files on the internet for free again. And you're gonna remember this, Garrett. We sent a big email out. Hey everybody, we won. Uh, all the files are free again. Told you we could do it. Thanks for hanging in there. and. This is what puts the lie to everything I'm hearing right now on the internet. Like these Frogecast guys, they say, all we're saying is we just don't want our files behind a paywall. Well, no, we've been there. DD, DefCAD puts all the files up for free, April 2021. The director of the catalog tells me, no, you're not going to put our files up for free. We're somebody now. You're going to pay us to put those files up. Why was DefCAD putting those files up? Because we want the argument that these files were published and that they weren't illegal republications according to export control law. We've been fighting this for what, since 2013? And I'm thinking there's this beautiful chance to put the FGC up within this set of files and make a court take recognition of this most popular and important file online, created by a foreign developer, by the way. So there's an additional argument that there's no export control of this file. What I learn from the director of the catalog is, no, our files are valuable. We own them. You're going to pay us for them to release them open source. Okay. And then it's, you know, I'm negotiating with terrorists at that point. I don't want to overstate this, Garrett, but literally I've got emails, right, where we're going for a TRO against the feds because the Department of Justice, even though export control reform happens and all this stuff goes to the commodity classifications list, and we have this argument that, hey, this stuff isn't in control anymore. We put it online and the DOJ says, nah, we're going to arrest your client for doing this. Nevertheless, it still violates ITAR and now it also violates the EAR. So I ditch my car and my phone and go into hiding in a fucking motel in Austin for as long as I can until a judge hears our argument about whether these files are free or not. Again, okay, again, I'm like re-traumatizing myself about this bullshit. And what I learn from the catalog is, no, we're somebody now and you're gonna pay us money 
for these free files. That was such an original sin. And I told the director of the catalog at that time, okay, buddy, I'm going to pay you guys for this. All right. You are over socialized. There's a lot of shit wrong with this. I'm going to do it for the good of the motherfucking land. Okay. But we're not going to do it again because I don't believe in intellectual property. I think it's worth just going over this again, just to make sure this is clear to, to everyone listening. DEF CAD in 2021 is operating with a membership fee, but we get the point, we get the opportunity uh, where we are able to remove that membership fee for certain files, including these catalog files, and put these up for free as we have always intended. And we, in fact, do so for a short period of time. And as a result of doing so, number one, we get our first DMCA from the catalog for putting a file up for free. There is no membership fee. There are no tests. There's no information collection. We are giving the file away and we are DMCA'd for it. Uh, they will claim you're lying if you say it was a DMCA. Well, di didn't he quote the DMCA? What was it? Uh, it was nothing. It was, a, it was, hey, I'm going to lead a rebellion online and I've got free men don't ask behind me and we're going to cause such a shitstorm if you put our stuff up for free. Okay. So you're going to pay us I, money. I'm referring to this at Mac guy. Didn't he threaten DMCA? Oh, fuck him. He threatened DMCA years later. I'm, I'm talking about 2021, the director of the catalog. That's my memory as well. We put th This was when we were doing this CAD CAM distinction, right? <laughs> yes, but uh, you, you think Atmac did a DMCA back then? He didn't, uh, he didn't actually do one. He threatened one. In that same time? That's what I recall. Man, I'm sorry to step on you then, buddy. I, I thought that was like a year later. I mean, why don't we double check this real quick? Because I'm sure I can dig up the ticket. Stand by one. That'd be funny if they ac accused us of lying, though. It's like... No, they would. They would if that was not accurate. <laughs> but I mean, what what a retarded thing to say. Like, no, we didn't do a DMCA. I mean, we're gonna, but we didn't do it back then. No, we would have never. <laughs> All right. Uh, May. OK, May 2nd, 2021 at Mac. I am contacting you to please remove any traces of the big point from your website. I under no circumstances have given. OK, so he doesn't he doesn't say the at, uh, he doesn't say the DMCA. OK, I don't know that that's worth. I, I liked how passionate you were about. I'm sorry. So I stepped on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, aside then, then when else, aside from this this takedown notice, do they demand payment for the files? It, February of 22 is, is their next time they ask for payment. And that is, that's Pew. He's asking for money. So with the term suspense and what becomes a catalog, there is the obsession, the positive obsession with compensation and money. So they were performing, you know, like in Marxist terms, valorization of their of their labor and a kind of pseudo commoditization, even if they were uncomfortable with developing the commodity form of what they were doing, they saw it as so valuable, not just ethically, I mean, economically. So there was always this tension. There was like this mistrust of us because it was like we weren't sharing the secret for what unlocks <laughs> the, the, the money tree, you know? <laughs> and, and there is no secret. That's just it. Like there really is no secret. Still, this mistrust begins to like delay communication and every attempt we have at this point to work with deterrence suspense to build things like, you know, we did that uh, Barrams and Bitcoin, you know, or, and we did, uh, we, we gave them like these influencer agreements and shit because like they're Zoomers, you know, and like maybe they'll respond to that. They just rejected that stuff. And even like, I remember the Barrams and Bitcoin in 21, they're saying like, you know what, you shouldn't have even had Barrams and Bitcoin. You should have just gave us the money. Right, right. So this is sort of the, the sordid history, I suppose I'll use that term of, um, of their sort of transformation into an ostensible ally with us. I mean, there was always a sense that they um, playfully shat on us. Uh, even in Ivan's earliest interviews, he's making claims like we didn't care about the quality of our of our designs. Let, let's lay that out on the table, Cody. Did did we care about the quality of our designs? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, right. This becomes like the defining ethos, right, of the later DD and, and the catalog. Well, actually, you know, we invented the idea of testing files. Obviously, there was always a testing culture. And our very first AR-15 receiver was, was a version 5. You know, when, when I did that big uh, vice doc, I was saying like, hey, come out with me to the range. We, you can watch our testing procedure. Oh, look, we tested, you know, like 100 rounds on our receiver today. That's good progress. Here, we'll go back and make some adjustments. You know, we were always teaching this process. I think where that opportunity for identity arises is, you know, we just had like these, in, in their words, junk files ready to, to put up as placeholders on DEFCAD when we relaunched DEFCAD in 2018. And this is almost like if you read that old report from that British Institute on JSTARC, this is almost like the superhero origin story of JSTARC and, and the wider community. They download that AR-15 model that we got from that dude in San Marcos or whatever. And they say, wait a minute, this bolt is 
he's totally off. Like, you can't even make a working AR-15 with this. And like, you know, I'm on Twitter and I, and I tell Jay Stark, like, okay, great, fix it. And he's like, I will fix it. You know, and so they discover like, it is possible to fix it. And then they go, wait a minute. We didn't just fix this stuff. Like these guys never cared about this in the first place. This was always symbolic for them. This is always, you know, theory had leftist, you know, graduate school bullshit for them. Like we brought principles of engineering to the space. You know, this becomes an opportunity for the accumulation of, of identity and meaning. And, and I, we never faulted them for that, right? We never, we never gainsaid them about that for years. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, look, I will act as an advocate for the community at this point. Like, there is definitely a shift in the expectations around how you release files, how you develop files, how you test files, right? That that comes uh, at least coincident uh, with the, the rise of deterrence dispensed. And I think we must credit this to the fact that these are perhaps more established developers. They've worked in, in corporations developing software before, uh, sometimes quite major ones. And they're, they're bringing those expectations into the space in a way that maybe they just didn't quite exist before. Like, it's not like we weren't testing at the time, obviously, but they certainly do advance that conversation a bit. I think we can credit them that. Uh, look, I'm happy to give them that, right? I'm happy to give GunCAD a lot of its achievements, the FMDA stuff, the rail stuff, printing locks, like very important stuff, okay? But we're doing Ghost Gunner like this whole time. And if we didn't meet military specifications, sometimes multiple times over and ship a product, you know, that didn't burn people's houses down, if we didn't do these things, we'd be out of business and we wouldn't be able to stay in the courts. Like it's it's kind of laughable to then retrospectively or or after the fact say, well, actually, defense distributed is like entirely pantomiming. You know, we're, we're like a, a deeply commercial company at this time. We were simply focusing our efforts on building a platform for people to upload files. You know, there's a huge trove of like FOSCAD stuff from 13 to 18. It, it was more about displaying what could be done at DEFCAD and promoting that with a discrete set of models for our settlement conversation back in 2018. But, you know, this is ancient history now and everyone like transitions that into important touchstones and kernels of their own identity. And I don't want to fault them that. But, you know, like the fantasy can run away so hard that you can get like these totally contradictory, paradoxical things. We're like, well, actually, they weren't even doing this at all until we started doing it. Right, right. Which not only, you know, discredits us, whatever, we're used to it. It discredits the you know, large number of people who were in the community prior to this time, some of whom suffered greatly for it, Imura comes to mind, in, you know, developing GunCat well before these guys were even aware that it existed. What you began to see is like, once a certain value or a sense of yourself, you know, gains a power over you, it has a tendency to set itself up as like, the sole value possible. In fact, Hartman in this Schmidt essay says like the tyrant over the whole human ethos. Now testing files is not just like how I define myself and my particularity as an individual. Now testing files is like the reason that this even exists. And if you don't do this the way we say you do it, then you're not doing it. And in fact, we're the only ones doing it. Do you see like, it's uh, like what Schmidt calls the tyranny of values. I think there's something to this. And I liked the term you used earlier about about the runaway, right? Because the, the only way you, you're able to maintain sort of your superiority over your, your fellow developers. Um, you know, I, I'm the only one who's testing at all. Well, okay, we'll all start testing too. We're gonna build Arbicoolia, we're gonna build Black Lotus. We're all gonna test as well, maybe even better than you guys do. Well, okay, well, you know, we're the only ones testing to our, our secret standards, right? Um, you have to tighten and tighten and, uh, you know, advance and advance and advance um, this this sense, right, in order to maintain your your profile. And so you you end up in a place where, you know, this just happened, right? Um, some guy uh, was apparently in the uh, open beta for the OK Boomer, right? And he posts a picture of his frame on Reddit. And I think the frame didn't come out very good. And I am now being told that they are demanding people in that open beta show pictures of their hands uh, in order to compare it to the photo <laughs> that was posted on Reddit. Uh, because, you know, the worst possible thing in the world is to leak from a beta and you, you better identify yourself, right? This, this is the result of this kind of, uh, of pathological uh, insistence on not just, you know, creating value through testing in this example, but uh, being the person who tests. Yeah. Oh. And, and also like creating that office, okay, that office of the person who tests and competing for spots in the beta. And I'm not saying these aren't good ways to administer this stuff or like social Taylorism isn't a way to manage a project, but you can see how it has a quasi theological, you know, there are, there are subtleties here, which are almost religious where it's about like ranting people, things to do in a hierarchy, giving people meaning, right? Formal 
diversions from the object itself and saying like, well, we're conducting this process for a year. And like, it almost begins to look like something else as if the purpose of this process is not to put out the gun. It is to kind of socialize a group of people into a way of being, into a way of knowing. And I don't think that's just theory. I think that's actually what's going on. I mean, if the purpose was to put out the gun, then <laughs> the boomer might be up by now. <laughs> it's interesting, these little detours that have been made now. And of course, there's a new value that's being hit upon, which is you know free and profit. And this idea of, like I mentioned earlier, this conviction that there's economic value to what they're doing. And in fact, hmm, look, on, on this question of value, we're actually seeing, I think, the new, the new thing they've hit upon. It's not just enough to talk about testing now and, and to isolate yourself that way. It's this location of economic value and this way of this pleasure they get in renunciation of that economic value, the surplus enjoyment of saying, hey, actually, this thing's so valuable. My contribution is that you can't make money on it. And the way I know that I'm contributing to this cause is that I I give it away, but you know, like there's certain things you can't do with it, and you certainly can't make money with it because GunCAD doesn't just mean testing things; it means creating very valuable things that no one should make money on. And that's a that's a very interesting religious attitude, right? Which again is likely informed by the the same cycle I'm I'm mentioning earlier, where when your your main goal is ultimately pro felicity, profile creation, you know, marketing of your of your identity, um, this is sort of the the only way that you can go. This is the only way that you can remain fresh. Well, okay. I, I don't know if, you know, is it freshness? It's like these guys, like we talked about the tyranny of values. I mean, these guys are now willing to take their, like we mentioned earlier, their kind of insecurity, the difficulty they have with the idea of being commercial or commercializing. They're ready to raise that up to the level of like an ethic where like it is wrong, right? <laughs> it is it is a moral crime for you to sell a file. You know, that's not what this is about. And we will cast you out. And in fact, it's not only about value and disvalue. It's not only about friend and enemy, they're now threatening violence over the fact that, you know, some people are reselling free software. Uh, and like, I'm not even saying that we're reselling free software because of course we've built a complex way of doing this to where we can't be tagged with selling the software. We're selling a subscription, which gets you access to other things. It's a long story, but this accusation to them rises to the level of enmity and to the level of violence where I think mean, I just, someone sent me that screenshot of, on Reddit where they're like, all pirates are going to be hung, you know? And they're thinking like, well, someone is going to be the guy to bring the DMCA in here and we're going to figure this out. I mean, th this is a full horseshoe at this point. Right. We, we've now come full circle to where uh, we, <laughs> we start this community fighting the government and uh, now we're invoking the government to fight uh, people on the same side as us. I, I would like to say it's a very strange state of affairs, but this, this is how these communities tend to go right. We see this historically. We see this with every leftist community that's ever existed. It well, just, this is how it happens. Okay. Yes. It, this is, this is organic, but it's almost stranger than they're going to use the government to fight us in their bizarre counter transfer, the psychic, you know, manipulation necessary. We are the government and they're the anarchists fighting us. Uh, again, that's, that's PLA boy from that transcript uh, that I mentioned to you. He's like, we're against the system, right? We're anarchists. You know, I, I don't care about the NFA. I'm a silencer developer. I, I don't care about any laws. DEFCAD is the system. And so there's this idea that like, well, somehow we're not using the modern state and we're not violating libertarianism by upholding intellectual property when we fight DEFCAD. DEFCAD is the feds. And so, you know, it, it's this perfect way to completely avoid what you're actually doing. Right, right, right. And, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, this idea that I don't want to hit PLA boy too hard. I mean, it's not like that's stopping him from hitting us, but uh, I'm not even hitting him. I'm saying like, man, no, but I'm gonna. <laughs> so yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that he's he's gonna fight the NFA by posting silencers. Well, that that's not nothing, right? Uh, posting a a good silencer design out there that facilitates people creating their own silencers. Last time I checked, though, the NFA is still there. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's going to be there, no matter how many silencers you print. If you're gonna fight the NFA, you have to fight it in court, right? But for some reason, they're not willing to do that. Uh, so, well, who can I fight? DefCAD. I can fight DefCAD. They're the real feds. I can fight them. I, well said. I think that's an elementary case. I think that is how it's actually operating. If, if we want to call it ideology, it's working on that level. I think there's a little more there, though, where, okay, the NFA has some kind of reality to this guy, PLA boy, right? It, it, he knows it well, probably, and could, could tell you about the NFA. And yet uh, the ITAR, for example, and the EAR, these things don't. These things are not real. Or really, 
probably anything else. There's a number of like digital statutes this guy probably doesn't know about. And so they would probably take issue with what you said, Garrett. We're like, well, the only way I can fight the NFA is a suit. No, that's like some boomer talk, man. That's like conservative stuff. Like you're not going to win in court against the NFA. Like the only way to fight the NFA is to put a bunch of silencers on, on the internet to where everyone has a silencer. Okay. I understand that. Are you doing that? Is that at what's actually happening? And then I think this is where we, we introduce the, the idea of the object cause of desire. I think it's more interesting for these people to take the bigger restrictions like the NFA and all this stuff and then kind of create enough distance from their activity and actually fighting that thing so that they can sustain intense desire and intense fantasy you know, about that opposition. Austin Jones is, of course, the best example of this, right? Like he's been fighting the ATF and their ammunition restrictions for about as long as we've been doing defense distributed, right? But he's only been fighting it, you know, in his mind. And what keeps him safe, this surplus enjoyment for him is the fact that there's no risk that he will actually encounter, you know, make some kind of deadly encounter with the ATF. It is the same thing, I think, with PLA Boy and the rest of them. It's enough if they can have some kind of encounter on social media with DEFCAD. That's the closest brush they want to have with, with any of these powers, to your point. Sure, sure, sure. Well, okay. So let me let me put back my my community advocate hat on here, right? And and you've brought it up, and I'll I'll repeat it, right? Why is it that there is any value in trying to fight these statutes in court, and why can we not just be anonymous on Twitter and put these designs out and print five million uh, FTNs and five million super safeties, and uh, effectively defeat these rules, these laws, without actually having to uh, to fight them in court? Why can't we do that? Well, it happened, right? Like that's what the community does. Super safety's out. Like everybody puts this stuff up anyway. Odyssey is unimpeded. I mean, we all won, right? Because enough people do it. And it's the same thing as in like the file sharing wars. There's just no way to police intellectual property on the internet. No one can really do it. Every now and then you catch somebody and you give them a really bad sentence. But in the end, you know, we've strongly degraded um, certain regimes of IP. And in the end, we've strongly degraded gun control because this stuff is just out there. Like everybody gets that much. And so that is all still true. But when you have the opportunity to force some of these constitutional questions, and these are rare things, I'm saying you should consider taking the opportunity. And I will not be personally and as an organization, I won't be shamed into settling those conflicts simply because everyone thinks, well, Odyssey's up. We're good. We don't need it. That's to misunderstand how precarious the situation is. Odyssey itself is hanging by a thread. Indeed. Uh, there's, there's, there's a billionaire you know, in Thailand or whatever. And if he wakes up, tomorrow and decides he's done, <laughs> Odyssey's over. You know? and, right. Okay. There is some functional autonomy there. That's important. And we need this ignorance and this not knowing. We need it to happen. If it was just defense distributed doing shit all the time, we would be stuck in court forever, stuck in a bottle, nothing would be getting done. So, you know, you need both. But I, I don't even, I'm not even trying to, you know, evangelize or persuade anyone to our argument at this point. I'm just not going to be cowed into telling you that, oh, you're right. Intellectual property is real. And we respect you. You know, I don't. Well, we'll get to intellectual property in a in a moment, perhaps. Let me see if I can try to salvage my um, my three steps that I intended to, to set this conversation on. We started with this this safety and stabilization concept. How did we get here? I think we we've done a decent job of going through to some degree the legal history and and the, the current legal state of play. Um, you know, guys, surprise, surprise. Even though you are broadly able to ignore it, the files are still considered. And now I remember the point I was trying to make earlier that I that I could not remember, right? Because for, for the longest time, I was very much convinced by this idea, right? That it is good if people are generally ignorant of the actual legal threat they face, because acting, you know, in that ignorance, just, you know, again, it's the same idea of flooding the market with 5 million super safeties. Like, if everybody is at her just doing this stuff, and they're not cowed, and they're not scared by possible legal consequences, that in itself is valuable, not just because it produces, you know, a great surplus of designs, but it creates sort of a... Um, a zeitgeist, right? We're like, yes, of course we are. We are doing this, right? Like, how can you enforce a law that everybody is is flagrantly violating it? And I'm, I'm not saying I don't believe that any longer, but we are now seeing people taking action based on that understanding that is directly detrimental to the community overall. I'm talking about bringing copyright back into the community um, as a way to fight the real enemy, who is not the ATF, who is not every town, uh, but DEFCAD themselves, right? That's who we got to fight. And to do this, we have to adopt the weapons of our enemies, the things that will will, will destroy this community, uh, destroy sort of the, the entire mission here by bringing this in. Uh, so I no longer believe that 
it's wise to just let these people ignore the foundations of their own ethos. Well, you know, to some degree, I'm ambivalent, but I, I agree with you on like a kind of mass politics, mass public point. Yeah, there's a critical mass of like stupidity where they're like, well, DevCAD is doing something that I don't understand, makes me feel bad. And when I follow the leader, he says I should feel bad. So I'm just going to do something stupid to fight that something stupid that they're doing. And now it becomes a kind of intentional clusterfuck, weaponized, know nothing. Yeah, yeah. Let's lay this out here because I, I think this is important and I, I hope our therapy patients can, can walk away with this. Why should they avoid copyright? What will happen if they embrace copywriting their files? Uh, you know what? To each his own, Garrett, but copyright is not a great method for censoring speech. And I would argue that that's the greatest lesson of copyright. Back to our discussion about commercialization, copyright was built to help you commercialize an idea, okay? It's like a civil privilege that you get that gives you a little monopoly for a little bit to help you make some money on something. <laughs> it's not a speech control. It's not used very well that way. And so whether you, you we can get to the fundamental question of like, is IP real though? Uh, or we can just go to basic questions of, of liberal property norms, you know, in, in this country. I'm, I'm happy to do it on any level, wherever you want to take it. I mean, it's worth going into this. So your point so far is that it's not going to have the effect that you think it will. Like, it's not going to stop us. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, we have good reasons for doing what we're doing. What, what effects will it have, perhaps? Well, you're always rolling the dice. So there's always these really cool unintentional effects. Maybe we'll create a, a cool new religion of copyright people. Or, you know, we see all these people workshopping a new kind of license where it's like an everybody but def cab license. I mean, that'll be fun. You know, let's let people work on that. But back to this earlier criticism, I think it's enough for people to just play act at that. I don't think anyone's actually doing it. It's just this thing you do online for continual profile validation and to kind of signal to other people your particular group identity and your affiliation and whatever the drama is of the day. And that's the real product of this community. It's mostly a lot of drama. And, you know, sometimes you got to give them what they want. But, okay, they're going to use copyright. Well, I don't want to walk them through how easy this is going to be to beat. But it's like, you know, the first question you should ask yourself is, do I have the copyright on this Turkish pistol that I ripped off? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can, can I establish that I have the copyright? Or like Uber Clay, that, that gentleman that you were so patient with in that Ghost Gunner stream, he we went ahead and gave himself the copyright and free men don't ask. Well, you know, doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I think play acting is sort of the right the right word for that. Again, you know, if I'm if I'm supposed to be a community advocate, I'm not doing a very good job at it, right? Yes. There, there is a there is You're a sense in the community. There, there. No, I'm I'm not. Uh, there, there is a sense when they talk about. I think laws in general, like that, these things are magic wands. You know, you, you wave your magic wand of copyright, and things just magically get better. You wave your magic wand of constitutionality. You know, like did you know, guys, that the ATF is unconstitutional? The NFA is unconstitutional. Um, no, for sure. Yeah, uh, Hoover's going to be a free man. Um, just you wait. Right. 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 It just doesn't work that way, right? It just doesn't work that way, as I, I suppose they will find out. Look, there's just different levels of, of engagement here, and it's always going to be that way because this is now, like I said, a, a mass public. All right, well, there's been a legacy of 20th, 21st century you know, political science and how people hold beliefs and like what's actually going on. And you know, I, Gary, I think you see the, the best in people. You want to do this podcast with me because you, know, you think our community is at least rationally ignorant, can actually be led to, if given enough time, a broadly correct Kind of I, I think I think there are some therapy patients um, who cannot be reached, <laughs> but in general, I would like to believe. Look, here, here's a point that I think we'll we'll make maybe more strongly later, right? But the the sound and the fury that we're seeing over this latest issue, the sound and the fury that we're always seeing, like we have the numbers, guys. We we have technology that then monitors the entirety of GunCAD. Um, these people represent like a single digit percentage of what GunCAD is, right? There's a much much broader world of GunCAD outside of this this little Twitter space, who in general, we have very friendly relations with. Um, and that's why they're the ones who are showing up to the events that we sponsor. They're the ones showing up to SHOT Show. And these are the guys who maybe this episode is is meant to to reach, because I think these guys sometimes see the copyright thing and they, they don't know what's going on. They don't necessarily know what to believe about it. Uh, these are the second order patients who who might otherwise be damaged by those those hurt people hurting people. Hey, you know what? Well said, Garrett. Let this be a document to where okay, people can come back to this and just get to fill in on the history and IP and what should I think about this? What should I think about that? They'll at least get a you know American counterpoint. Okay, great. It should exist for that reason. I'm sure I don't do enough of that. I just don't care to. 
anymore. But like today, that guy, you know, Zerad, he messages me, he says, hey, what's this thing going on about DMCA or whatever? I, I don't even understand. And so I try to fill him in on, on what's going on. So, okay, people should be filled in. But you know, Zerad's a good example, right? That guy comes into GunCAD, he develops interesting technology, he commercializes it because that is one option available to you in the space. And then what does he say when I explain the DMCA thing to him? He's like, dude, it's not even worth talking about. They're just a bunch of Discord LARPers. Yes, yes, that that is ultimately what I what I believe. But okay, here's here's where I'm getting back to you know what is the effect of this this copyright fight because these uh, these Twitter guys these LARPers as we call them, we have seen they do have some kind of effect at least among uh, themselves or among the spaces they they police, where by my calculations they have now caused more people to leave GunCAD than are currently active in their space. Right. That's an interesting study. I I, I haven't seen the numbers. Obviously, it's very lonely <laughs> to, to turn to Spitz chat. But... Well, I mean, look, yeah, we, we learned that from Dr. PC recently that <laughs> the chat is <laughs> is uh, actually not all that active. But imagine how much worse this might get if ev suddenly every time someone gets into a kerfuffle around credit, we get a rare breed versus uh, WOT situation, right? Well, that would be interesting at least. But instead, we get a simulated version of that, right? We get the LARP version of it where, you know, I think the first time I noticed this was that Vin Win guy. You know, this was the first use of copyright I was aware of in the space where somebody else was doing like a 1911. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. That's maybe the, the primary example that I've seen of, of people getting bullied out of the space. The 1911 specifically, um, so much effort has been spent and so much damage has been done in order to preserve Freeman's uh, claim to being the first developer to make a, a printed 1911. Was this about Freeman? Is that where this starts with the VIN thing? Well, the, the 1911 thing, yeah. He's had this thing in development now for like two years. Um, and anybody else who who tries to develop one, they they bully him out of the space so that Freeman doesn't have to change his Twitter bio. Yeah, okay. And what do we see Vin doing? We see, we see him using copyright as a way of telling people that you know, he's homesteading the, the idea and the work. Okay, obviously, this is an abuse. And it is convenient to now that they find themselves in these places where, uh, you know, GunCat is what we say it is because we found ourselves here. And we weren't good at anything else. And therefore, what we do, that's what there is to do. And everything else is a scam. Right. Uh, it's another example of what we're talking about earlier, where I can I can very much understand the impetus, this idea that, you know, hey, don't I own my work? Uh, shouldn't it be the case that people can't just profit off of my work? Like, I get where this is coming from. And again, we have very friendly relations with the other 97% of, of GunCAD. We're able to work with them to try to smooth over problems they have with our method of operation. But this remaining 3%, uh, they take this the, the, these understandable impetuses, uh, they take these and they they hothouse them in their, their Discord servers to the point where it becomes quite pathological and we're kind of seeing the result. And that's because it's connected with identity. If I can take something that I'm doing, okay, I'm Freeman, right? And if I can make hay out of the fact that I'm working on this one gun for two years, all right, that's a good deal for me, right? Not in the gun space, of course, because that's a disaster. and It's not commercial. You're not delivering anything to anybody. But in terms of profile value, profile validation, and the constant updates required there, oh, this is great. I can milk this for a long time and get a ton of personal value out of it, a kind of surplus enjoyment. Like, you know, I don't care for the 1911. I don't, I don't care to necessarily commercialize the 1911, but I'm somehow in this parallel virtual way, the guy who reinvented the 1911. That really infuses me with a sense of meaning and identity, and that is worth fighting people over. And that is what is operative. There is a sense, you know, here's where I can get back to like radical FOSS ethics, right? There, I think, is a sense in this sort of catalog side of the space where the worst possible thing you can do is release a design. Um, because when you release a design, that design must live up to the expectations you have built around it, right? And so we're only going to release this design when we have... Uh, lovingly crafted every single little detail. And that might sound like a good thing, and in some ways it is. But FOSS says that it is far better to release early and to release often so that you can get the maximal number of eyes on your design uh, so that you can as quickly as possible get this thing out there in case something ever happens to you, in case some like somebody else can take the idea and run with it. Like This is what this space is supposed to be about. We're all going to work together to make guns, right? Yeah, look, and and spread the signal, right? Everybody knows that ethics, spread the signal. Well, yeah, yeah. it is an embarrassing fact that probably most of the guns you look at, DefCat has done a better job of spreading the signal than some closeted, buried Odyssey page. 
Well, no, again, we, we know the numbers there, right? Like, except for like extreme outliers like the FGC9, every gun that we have hosted on DevCat has been downloaded more than uh, its equivalent on Odyssey. I'm sure that there are exceptions there. There, there would have to be exceptions. There, there. are, but not nearly as many as you would expect. Okay, checking those numbers. But nevertheless, if the goal was uh, rapidly developing gun technology to defeat gun control, oppose every town and you know the brain trust who are writing gun control laws, and I don't know, to spread the motherfucking signal so that people can discover what is going on here, DEFCAD is more than accomplishing that goal. And so it is threatening to this object cause of desire, what I was talking about. Like if there's actually a group out there doing this thing that I say that I am doing, that's very threatening, you know? Right. Yeah, I'm not, I don't mean to laugh at it, man. It's well, just... this, here's, here's the second point that I was sort of leading up to, because, you know, I know what their response will be, which is that, okay, you know, whatever, you put you put out a new version of WinZip and it doesn't work very good, so what? Uh, you put in a bad version of a gun, it's going to blow up and, and maim people, right? They, yeah. accuse, they, they accuse us endlessly of, you know, having trash files, that this will result in, you know, it's guaranteed to result in some kind of catastrophic injury. And let's let's test that assumption. Let's pretend this is true. Because of course we know that there are a lot of 3D gun files. In fact, the vast majority of 3D printed gun files um, are not developed under Gatalog standards. They're developed by other groups that test things differently. If it was the case that all of these designs were inherently unsafe, then shouldn't like half of Reddit be walking around with their hands blown off right now? Well, no, clearly that's not the case, right? <laughs> And so given that that observation is pretty easy to make, how do we then justify this, this continued adherence to, you know, anything less than testing for two years and only letting like five people into the beta is the only safe way to do it? How do we justify this? Well, I can only assume, number one, this comes from a, a sense of, of corporate solidarity where, you know, the worst possible thing that can happen is that our reputation gets besmirched. A little bit and obviously that'll happen if somebody hurts themselves but it'll also happen if somebody prints a gun and it doesn't work right this is again what we saw with the okay boomer where someone prints the frame of the boomer doesn't work shares it on reddit they completely chimp out over the fact that freeman looks a little stupid now that his beta gun didn't work that's i suspect a, a part of this right i think it's also uh, again a pro felicity thing where the only way you can really justify your idea of superiority is by conjuring this this horrible threat of 3D printed guns. And I, I find it deeply ironic that the same person who spends all day on Twitter mocking politicians for saying that 3D printed guns are going to blow up will then turn around and say, if you put those rails out there, those guns will blow up. It is a very absurd state of affairs that I think can only be explained by a, uh, a pathological need to cultivate one's own ego. Nice. The only thing I'll add to that is this is where the idea of authorship is, is something more than what's contained in liberal theory, okay? Authorship is an ideological state apparatus, all right? It's something used to control. It's a function. It's used to precede a work, to limit, to be a, a valve. Um, maybe the catalog thinks it's only practicing brand management, okay? They're allowed to do that however they want. In fact, they've specced into doing that as like the only thing that they do because the files are to have no other destiny. Okay, still, they're promoting this, a certain consumer attitude, which is actually aligned with, right, like every town for gun safety and other people who concern Shoal on, on the whole question of products liability. And there's a nostalgia for, like we've mentioned earlier, engineering standards and, and commercial product standards. And what's funny is, right, these are intentionally non-commercialized components, and yet you've actually done a lot of the work to get yourself into trouble here. You've almost taken up all the downside without any of the upside of commercializing these things. Because in the interest of preserving the idea of authorship, creating that, reproducing that capitalist function, which is what copyright's for, you have accidentally given implied warranties, let's say, about the merchantability of your product or its fitness for the purpose of shooting. So like, um, you know, if I'm every time for gun safety now, I go, great. I go after the catalog because they represent the files as safe. They represent the guns as safe. So when they blow up, uh, now I can nail them with a judge. You understand the irony there? No, of course, of course. I know that we're going to get accused of when people listen to this, we're going to get accused of saying, oh, there should be no testing standards. There should be no engineering standards. It turns out like engineering standards are bad things. No, that's not what we're saying. Um, to simply reiterate what Cody said, maybe a more condensed version, much of what 
like when when Google or when I don't know what's a good example of a big comp, uh, company when Google or when Boeing have you know public standards for how they test, maybe ten percent of that is about actually ensuring their product will work as designed, and the other ninety percent is about maintaining the reputation of that company, maintaining that company's uh, not just reputation in a in a um, ethical sense but also a legal sense, right? Ensuring they are unimpeachable in court. Well, the open source approach is what if we strip away all that reputation stuff? What if we say, fuck my reputation? I don't care. I'm just going to develop stuff and I'm going to have good testing standards and I'm going to have good engineering standards, but I'm not going to let corporate bullshit, HR bullshit get in my way of putting out actual good work and putting it out quickly, right? I think the rest of GunCAD gets this. I don't think the catalog does. You know, agree to disagree. I, I think they get it. It's just they just have few cards really left to play well you can say that again do you want to talk about um our final section where we actually try to offer some advice yeah reconnection is it time for reconnection <laughs> i think it may be let's try to end this therapy session on a positive note right let's for for those who are listening to this and who are at least intrigued by our approach right well what can they do to to try to move forward in a, a healthier way, what can they do to increase the health of GunCAD? Well, I have some ideas for this. And, you know, Cody, feel free to jump in here as I as I go. Uh, but let's start with the, uh, you know, words matter, right? Like we all know that uh, if you're the kind of person who fucks up and then says, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm so stupid, that's not healthy, right? Well, similarly, if you're the kind of person who sees DefCAD open sourcing a file and you think they're stealing it, well, that's not healthy, right? The word stealing has a very strong emotional connotation. If you will actually look into the legal definition of stealing, you will find that data cannot be stolen, at least not in this manner. Data that has been put out there for free cannot be stolen. This is the fundamental insight that justifies uh, copying music, that justifies copying movies, right? And it justifies copying files as well. So I suggest you you consider your use of, uh, of language that may hurt you. and. Uh, Consider something else, right? Instead of saying we are stealing files, perhaps say we are liberating files. Your, your thoughts on that, Cody? I, I'm not going to be the most radical libertarian possibly here. People probably think, you know, like I said earlier, oh, I don't believe in intellectual property. Well, I'm not going to say that you can't find a justification for theories of intellectual property in the libertarian tradition, okay? Like there's credible scholarship that I think is good, that you can find a Lockean moral definition for intellectual property. Okay. Well, it just so happens, though, that like the legal fiction and the mythos in our country is Jeffersonian. You know, the legal tradition right now, it's not your natural right. Uh, that's where we are legally. But I, I would understand. It's intuitive to feel like you somehow own an ideal thing. Of course, Thomas Jefferson didn't believe that. So, you know, when you see the big Thomas Jefferson quote at Gatalog, think, what did Thomas Jefferson think about intellectual property? Maybe you won't like that. And God, whatever you do, do not Google Sally Hemings. Anyway, I would say there's room for disagreement in the space and FOSS and FOSS licenses and stuff. This is how hackers traditionally have negotiated how they work on projects and how groups work with each other. But we have to recognize that FOSS licenses, free software licenses are a compromise with a traditional liberal idea of authorship in the first place. Right. And I guess the community must ask themselves to what degree do they wish to, to compromise with the, uh, the state that they at least nominally reject, right? I don't know that they do. I, I see some of them pretend to reject the state. Uh, just don't know that they do. No. And again, you know, you can be in GunCAD and not be an anarchist, right? You don't have to be crazy like me and Cody. All we ask is that you do not get in our way. Look, I'm not even asking that you don't get in the way. You know, this is a reconnection, right? People are like, what can we do? Well, okay. You can consider, like Garrett says, the subtleties of ideas of property. Or you can sue. I encourage you to sue. That will make you stronger. You know, we will learn something about the law and we'll advance the conversation and there'll be less bitterness and like nature will heal, you know? So suing's good too. If you feel really strongly for this, you should sue because if you feel strongly about anything, you should risk something for it. And I'm here for that, right? I was here for that when every town sued on a theory of trademark. That was very cynical. No one here believes in every town's theory of trademark, right? We're all social bandits. We understand the good of abusing every town's trademark. All right, well... Do you believe in some kind of gun CAD group's trademark? Like, surely you don't. Uh, but if you do, well, then sue. I, I respect 
every federal court in this country, right? You get a federal court order, Garrett and I are going to respect that federal court order. That's an interesting commentary. I, I mean, did I say too much? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, are you being telling the truth that we will respect the uh, the court order? I guess we'll have to. Well, goddamn, all we've ever done is respect court orders around <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, well, I mean... Know, I mean this is very easy to do. You like, may have to you may have to convince me in the final cut to leave that in. <laughs> go get it done. Okay. Yeah, Just yeah, go yeah. get it done. Um right. Okay, well, like Pew, right? What what's the point you want to make about Pew? Well, Pew actually had good ideas. Or at least in germ, he was like, Hey, there ought to be a better way to do this. Okay. Well, I don't know, Pew. I think I got the message, but maybe you came up with a better way to do it. You know, uh, share that. Maybe the community should do that better way of doing this. Let's talk about another uh, therapeutic idea that, that may help you feel better, right? This is this is um, this is a common bit of advice for people who have been gaslit, for people who have been lied to, uh, which is to begin asking for proof, right? Don't just take claims at face value. Begin asking for proof of those claims. When you have someone who has been proven to have lied multiple times, uh, begin asking for proof, right? So when you hear that there's some French guy out there who is uh, maliciously editing files and releasing them, ask for proof, right? Yeah, it turns out you might not find any. Uh, when you hear that DefCat asks for social security numbers, when you hear that we've been hacked and dumped multiple times, ask for proof. Turns out you won't find any. Uh, make this part of your habit when interacting with accusers like this. Ask for proof. And you will find that uh, your life will become much simpler when you realize that uh, they generally cannot back up the things that they have to say. Ask us for proof as well. Uh, we can provide it. Uh, we will be providing it as part of this, of course. Ask for proof. Look, I, I hate to provide proof. I hate to have to do that. It seems to be a defensive requirement. And I know people have sent us questions for this meeting, Garrett. Perhaps we can answer one while we still have time, or I, I know we can answer some of them an out of battery. Yeah, I'm not sure we've actually mentioned this yet, um, but we will be appearing on Out of Battery this coming Saturday. Um, and I think that's primarily where we're going to do the Q&A. We, we've got a nice list of questions already. I think that there are some more being generated by that team. It may be easier just to, to leave the Q&A for that because it'll also be live. Yeah. You know, you said another thing about lies, ask for proof. I, look, everyone knows better than to ask for proof about this. I, I, how long have I been available in this space? You make yourself... More than available, Garrett. Anyone can ask us questions about these things. And yet, over the years, they prefer not to. In fact, every time everyone's whipped into a frenzy on Twitter, we never see anyone ask for us to delete their accounts or to like explain what we do. It, it doesn't seem to translate. And so maybe, right, that's, that leads to an argument about just accepting this as noise or some kind of like, some kind of two minute hate or something. But, you know, I, I think that the, the essence here is that. Everyone understands that there's something fictional uh, to the accusations, and yet the truth can come in the form of a lie. You know, something essentially true is still being conveyed, even though the facts themselves don't check out. We spoke about that earlier. So this is why I think I think it functions. That's the point. Like It functions, and people know better than to really press too much because they know there's not a lot there. Um, that's why, sorry, and this part I'm a little cynical, but obviously if anyone listening to this ever had accusations or questions, about what we do. Yeah, you can ask us and we'll show you what we do and why. Yeah, we're always happy to talk about this stuff. Yeah, you can come and talk to us. We'll mercilessly, you know, chap your ass like that PLA boy, but you can come and talk to us. Honestly, dude, if PLA boy had just been willing to talk to us when we offered a phone call, right? He, he, he attempts to tell this story in a very strange way where he says that uh, he reached out to us and we refused to talk to him except on our own terms. Well, actually, the truth is kind of the opposite, where we offered to have a phone call and talk about any subject under the sun, right? And he refused to talk to us unless, I guess, number one, he didn't want to do a phone call. Um, I thought maybe that's because he didn't want his voice being out there, but he's okay with going on Frogecast, so who knows about well, that? He was double booked, Garrett. He had a two-hour he had a two-hour podcast book. Must have been, must have been. Oh, but in any case, yeah, he, um, he was not interested in talking unless we immediately conceded his point, right, that we're going to take his files down. I'm sorry, guys, that's just not how negotiation works. You don't approach negotiation by saying, okay, uh, my condition for talking is that I win. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, he did use the word ethic, and of course, you know, I don't think he knows what that word means, but ethical licenses, PLA boy, will answer your question live. Uh, 
they've been addressed in open source licenses. This was the big dispute that got ESR in trouble back in like 2020s. Um, maybe Garrett, you're aware, you know, a bunch of developers were fighting Amazon's kind of reabsorption, you know, capital's recuperation of, of some of their open source projects and some of the difficult personalities like we have in our space who are, let's say, more challenged in their sexual orientations or their gender identity. These people seem to be the loudest in these discussions, arguing for a new type of open source license on the basis of ethics, just like PLA Boy wanted. And they say, just like the people in our space are considering now, well, we'll come up with an everybody but DevCAD license. Same thing. These open source, so-called open source developers were trying to come up with like an everybody but fascist license, <laughs> you know, and everybody but the people who persecute the Palestinians license. Uh, this is being done and people can look at the history of these fights uh, right now with, with the Open Source Institute. And I'm not going to say it's all good news, but this has been, you know, an active topic of discussion and confrontation and there's just nothing to recommend it. Absolutely nothing. Um, I, I just don't think this is going to be a fruitful way to fight DEFCAD, and I doubt anyone, you know, has the stones to enforce it against us. Yes, indeed. So maybe I'll leave with with this, right? Which is that when you got into this space, I'm talking to everyone here, no matter when you got into the space, you got in the space based on this very radical notion uh, that you have a right to print a gun, you have a right to make your own gun in the privacy of your own home, um, and use that as you see fit. And that is something that is rejected by 99% of the rest of this country. But you said, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway, because that is my right. That is my legal right. And that is my ethical right. Let me suggest this as well. When we got into the space, we said, we're going to liberate files. We're going to ensure that files stay up on the internet because it is inherently valuable for information to be preserved. And we don't care whether people say, I don't want your file on my website. We don't care whether people say, uh, we're going to sue you. You need to take it down because we reject the fundamental premise of intellectual property. It's the same kind of radicalism applied to a very similar topic, right? You're totally comfortable with applying it to 2A, we are applying it to 1A. Have the courage of your convictions. Like don't just be a radical over, I just wanna print a machine gun. Be a radical in the sense that I reject intellectual property entirely and not just 80% arms intellectual property because you're very comfortable with that, right? But also your intellectual property. And you know what? My intellectual property as well. Reject all of it. Be an actual radical. I think that's well said. And I can even help people listening a little more. It seems that there's more of a comfort, for example, with denying that the product of defense distributed, you know, is anyone's specific property. No one would object to finding our stuff. And in fact, there's even this additional like deconstruction where Cody Wilson himself is not an author and doesn't have authorial interests or intellectual property in what he does. That's great. That's how I feel about everyone else. <laughs> so simply apply that, you know, think of me when you look at a file and be like, huh, that can't be anyone else's property. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the author function itself is, like I said, it's, it's ideological. Okay. And it's convenient for you now, but you know, we resist copyright, not just for historical reasons like, oh, it's, you know, its origins are in censorship and, you know, it actually promoted piracy. Like there are good libertarian stories uh, for rejecting copyright. Specifically though, like Garrett mentioned about the First Amendment, copyright is an instrument of the modern capitalist state. Copyright is an excuse to assert and reduplicate, you know, new types of control, new types of subjection under the law through agencies in the United Nations, like the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, the World Trade Organization, you know, things like TRIPS, SOPA, PIPA, all these things. And we're fighting that, okay? So like Jay Stark says, if GunCAD's about the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, you know, the two are blended. And if you promote a censorship regime or a way of constricting the flow of information, you are also restricting the Second Amendment. Just keep it in mind.